eternal Father who reigns throughout the universe. You are the creator, the God of this world and all the worlds. Now as we invite your presence here this morning, may your word remind us of all the blessings as we come into your awesome presence. We give thanks to you, Father, for your goodness, your mercy, as we exalt your name above the others, as we bow before you on this beautiful Sabbath morning. Lord, we seek forgiveness for our shortcomings. We realize our shortcomings, our omissions, our failures, and we plead for forgiveness as we seek renewal and revival for not only ourselves, but for others according to the promises in your word. May there be healing at Chattanooga first. Dedication to your service. Enable us through the guidance, the guiding Holy Spirit to not just be readers and hearers of the word, but help us to be doers. Help us share the good news of the plan of salvation by those about us in this world that seems to be crumbling around us. Thank you, Lord, that your mercy endures forever and that your promises fail not. Now, Father, as we continue our worship through the gift of music, May heaven's door stand slightly ajar so that the voices of heaven's multitude may join in our praise. Then as we go forth into the new week, may our thoughts come back to today's worship. We thank you for all these blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and our great High Priest. Amen. Our scripture reading today is 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and carried them in and sliced them and put them into a pot of stew, for they did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat. And it came to pass, as they were eating of the stew, that they cried out and said, O man of God, there is death in this pot. And they were unable to eat. But he said, Now bring meal. And he threw it into the pot, and he said, Pour it out for the people, that they may eat. Then there was no harm in the pot. We are pleased today to have Jamie George here at Chattanooga First Church. Jamie's a very talented violinist who also has an inspiring story to share. <clears throat> Jamie began playing the violin at the age of five. Born and raised in communist Cuba, he had many opportunities, including an offer to study in Moscow with some of the greatest musicians of our time if he and his family would renounce their belief in God. They refused. When Jamie was 10, miraculously, his family was given the opportunity to leave 
Cuba. They came to the United States where Jamie received a Christian education, violin lessons with the eminent violinist Cyrus Furrow. But Jamie dreamed of being a missionary doctor and in 1994 was accepted by University of Illinois School of Medicine. In 1996, he left medical school in a promising medical career to devote himself to full-time music ministry. Since 1988, he has traveled over 5 million air miles and has played in North, America, North, Central, and South America, Europe, Australia, and Asia, and the Soviet Union. Five continents in all and over 35 countries. He has recorded and released 16 albums. We welcome Jamie to our church today. We're happy to have you here. God together, that we have a God that is our mighty fortress. Amen. I don't know if your day and your life is a bit like mine. Seems that from the moment I wake up to the second that I go to bed, there is something to do, and it doesn't stop. And then things come up, and challenges and difficulties, things that are unexpected, but God is bigger than our problems and our challenges. And if we put our trust in him, he will not disappoint us or let us down. And um, this is my first time in this beautiful church. 
I was at the first church several years ago when it was in downtown Chattanooga. Uh, and I've seen the church as I drive by here many, many times, um, but I had not been in here. And I'm uh, privileged to be able to be here today with you uh, and worship. And this next song that I want to share with you reminds us of the peace and the refreshing that we receive when we take time away from the busyness of life and each and every day to spend in communion with God. Even though we may not get some things done because we stop to have our daily worship and devotion time, but we are refreshed in a way that nothing on this earth can come close to offering or matching. This song is titled, Be Still, My Soul. By the way, just a simple amen is good enough for me, um, if that's okay with you. I want to draw our attention to our scripture reading, um, if that's okay with you. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 38 to 41, and the version I have is the New King James uh, version. And it says, Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. 
Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and came and, and gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds, though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. So he said, Then bring some flour. And he put it into the pot and said, Serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Now, a few years ago, uh, many years ago now, I got married in 1997, and I think that when we go through these kinds of important events in our lives, we never imagine that something is going to go wrong. I got divorced, and I remember how difficult it was for the next few years for me to even just function. The, the pain, the devastation, the sadness, the guilt, um, all of those things were sometimes overwhelming. And there were times when I was about to go up on stage and do a concert and I would walk over to my violin case and put the violin case or put the violin inside the case and said, I, I can't do this. I'm just going to stop. I'm going to give up. I can't go up there and play and try to encourage people when my own life has fallen apart. And for a long time I struggled with this and I wrestled with God and I, why did all of these things happen to me? And I remember last year, it was Mother's Day weekend, and I scheduled concerts in North Carolina where my mother lives around the city of Charlotte. And I took my mother out for dinner on Mother's Day, and I said, Mom, I'm never going to get married again. This was just too difficult, too painful. I'm going to marry my violin. I said, she has nice curves, and she only talks back when I ask her to. I have plenty of things that I'm busy with, ministry, music, mission trips, helping others around the world. I'm done. And she said, that's all right, son. Just don't limit God if he's wanting to do something else in your life. And, and I sort of brushed off that statement. Well, like three years ago now, I was in Washington, D.C. for a concert. And I remember at the end of the concert, I talked with a young lady that had attended the concert. And we exchanged a few words. I spoke to a number of other people. A few months went by, and somehow we reconnected on Facebook. I sent her a friend request, and we dialogued a little bit. She told me how she had enjoyed the CD that she had taken home, and it had been a blessing through some difficult times. And I told her I lived in Chattanooga. She said she was going to go visit her sister in Atlanta in just another month or so. And I said, well, I'm just up the road an hour and a half or so. Do you want to get together and maybe have lunch or something? And she said, sure. Well, I went to her page. I learned a little bit about her. I was amazed she had been a professional women's football player. And I'm not talking about soccer football. I'm talking about American football. I went to her page and I saw pictures of her in full uniform running over three women on her way to scoring a touchdown. She ran half marathons and relay races and things like that. And, and I was a little intimidated, I must say. But I figured if I'm going to meet her where she's at and do something that she enjoys, then it should probably be something sports-oriented. So I said, when, when we get together, would you like to go jogging? And she said, sure, and could I invite you to go to a hot yoga class after our run? Now, I had never even heard of hot yoga, and before you start thinking about meditation and mysticism and any of those things, just give me a second before you make that determination. I thought, sure, it's the middle of the winter. How bad can something warm be for a few minutes? And so I picked her up early in the morning, and we went jogging. I spent that week, because it was a Friday morning when we went, on Monday I got home and I started jogging around my neighborhood to get in shape, you know. I didn't want her to embarrass me too much. And so I got to the point at the end of the week where I was running a 12-minute mile. 
And I was feeling pretty good about that. Well, I picked her up. We started jogging. She was running about an eight-minute mile, which meant that I was desperately trying to catch up. And so as we ran and I gasped, she would talk to me as if she was just walking. And I would have to time my responses to, yes, <laughs> I could barely breathe. And she wanted to just have a conversation with me. When we get to the end of the third mile, she says, um, I would like to run another one. Is that okay with you? And I said, yes, <laughs> but I'm afraid we're going to miss our hot yoga class in a few minutes. And she said, oh, you're right. And so we stopped jogging at the end of the third mile, and we made our way to the yoga studio. And I had never been in, in, in a hot yoga class. I thought you'd go in there, you know, you warm up, you stretch for a few minutes, and then you're out. This was 90 minutes of torture. We walked in there, and the room was almost 110 degrees with about 70% humidity. And the only thing I could meditate on was just surviving the 90 minutes, let me tell you. By the 30th minute, my mind was cloudy. And by the 60th minute, I thought the heavens were opening up and that was the end of my life right there. But I was determined I was not going to walk away from that class. I'd rather die than walk away. Afterwards, I was so weak, I didn't know where I was. We went to get something to eat. And then I left. I had some concerts in Texas that weekend. We didn't really talk anymore for the next year and a half. And so in May of last year, I told my mother what I just shared with you. And then in September, I was doing concerts in Hawaii, and I was bored one afternoon, and I went to her Facebook page, and I saw that she was in Puerto Rico on vacation, so I sent her a text message saying, you're in paradise. And we began to dialogue slowly and infrequently. And then she asked me to pray for her, and I began to pray for her. And then we began to talk a little more and pray, and both of us were scared, let me tell you. We'd both been hurt before, and we both didn't want to do anything that wasn't God's will first and foremost, and two, that would bring us pain and suffering. And so we took it very, very slowly. Had the chance to sit down and talk over uh, a morning and an afternoon. And I said to her when I sat down, and it was right here in Chattanooga in November of last year, I said, listen, I, I've been a failure at my relationships in the past. I don't want to keep doing the same things I've done before. And so instead of getting all excited about something and then you find out it's not working and you have to back out and it's embarrassing and uncomfortable, I have a list of questions for you. If you answer them correctly, then we can keep talking. But that was not as arrogant as it sounds. It was said very, very humbly. And in fact, she responded. She said, I'm glad to hear that because I have a, a set of questions for you too. And so we sat there and asked these questions. And when we were done answering them, they were exactly what we needed. And so we prayed and we said, if this is your will, Lord, then open the doors. And if not, then close the doors. And that was in November. And the Lord did open the doors. And we began dating in December. I knew that the Lord had brought us together. And so in February, I proposed. And two weeks ago, yesterday, we got married. And I got to tell you, I have not had this much joy and peace in my heart and in my life in many years. And it's all because I allowed God to be in control of my life and to work in my life. And I want to tell you that it doesn't matter what you may be going through in your life. If you allow the Lord that kind of access to your life, and if you allow the Lord to take over and to guide, we're not going to be disappointed to see what God is willing to do. And in that pot of stew, I thought I was that pot of stew. When they, when they gathered around that pot of stew and they were hungry, somebody, before they fed it to everybody else, somebody tasted what was in there, and they realized it was poison. If you and I would have been sitting around that pot of stew, what would we have done with that stew? Throw it out, right? But I want to suggest to you that you and I 
represent the stew in that pot. But God doesn't throw us out like we sometimes throw each other out. Haven't you heard people say, stay away from them? They're no good. They're a bad influence. We may come to God broken and messed up because of the, the, the choices or the things we have done or have happened in this life. But God doesn't throw us away. He says, I've got a plan for your life. And when we allow his Holy Spirit to come in, a transformation begins to take place. And we go from being broken and messed up to wholesome the way God wants us to be. And that is how I want to live every day and the rest of my life. This hymn is an invitation for us to let God be in control. I surrender all. amazing things that God has done in our relationship and in bringing us together is that Rochelle is not just wonderful and sweet and kind and loving. She's, she's very gifted, and God has given her a number of abilities and talents. And I believe that he's calling us together to do more than just music ministry with her background and uh, pro football, uh, and her ability to cook. She used to have her own uh, business as a chef. She incorporates uh, healthy lifestyle uh, speaking 
into the things she does, and we want to include that in our programs so that they're not just concerts. We want to be able to encourage couples to not only be together and stay together, but thrive and be happy and be able to share that love with others. It's not just enough to stay together if you're married. And uh, so I'm so excited to see what God is going to do as we come together. And um, even though I've been living here in the Chattanooga area for the last uh, 13 years, I'm not home very often. Um, and we'll continue to spend some time here, but since she has a job in D.C., I don't have a job. I just play. Um, she has a job in D.C. We're going to be there mostly. Uh, but it just worked out um, that several months ago we contacted Pastor Dale about being here today, and, and everything has worked out that we could be here the, the week after um, our honeymoon. And so I would like to invite Rochelle to come up uh, and share with you something that the Lord has put in her heart. As I am doing concerts around the world, she's praying where I'm at, asking the Lord to bless. And then we ask the Lord to put something in her heart to be able to share and encourage as we minister together. So, Rochelle, would you please come up? And I also want to introduce her mom, um, Mama Maria, as I call her, Mom Mary, uh, who is also here with us this weekend from Pennsylvania. Good morning. Well, I want to ask you first not to shower too much pity and sympathy on Jamie for his 90 minutes of hot yoga torture, because he's willingly gone back and completed 30 classes. Might have something to do with the fact that I went with him, but um, in, in seriousness, though, uh, as Jamie said, I often I am praying while he is playing, whether I'm present or elsewhere, and either praying for folks to be blessed and for the message that needs to be shared from, from God, that, uh, that he would place it on our heart to share it through us. And I never know exactly what I'm going to talk about until I'm up here, and, um, and it's often, it often coincides with what he chooses, what scripture he chooses to read. And, and discuss while he's here. And whenever I hear the one that, we, that he read this morning, I am also taken back to a more difficult time in my life because like Jamie, I went through a divorce and it was really, really traumatic years ago. And I was very cautious when I met him. And he mentioned that I played um, tackle football. Does anyone here like football? Anybody, anybody, okay. Um, so I was a running back, and my favorite move on the football field was a stiff arm. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, a move that the ball carrier uses to keep the defender away from them so they can continue running downfield in an effort to score. And as the defender gets just close enough, you can pop your arm out, usually hit them in the side of the helmet, and they usually drop pretty quickly, and you can continue on to score. So that was my favorite move on the field. Now. What I, it's a great move to have in your repertoire as, a, as an athlete, but I had actually carried that over into my personal life, so to speak, uh, emotionally speaking. Now, don't worry, I wasn't running around dropping people on the streets for no reason, but after my divorce, I was very cautious about trusting people and, and letting people in, and um, when I first met Jamie, I was certainly keeping everybody at that, di that safe distance with my emotional stiff arm. And I was broken and needed the Lord to fix me, and I'd, asked, I'd prayed and asked him to bring good people in my life and surround me with the right people and remove the wrong people, but I was very busy protecting myself. And in doing so, I, wasn't, I realized later that I wasn't fully trusting the Lord to do what I was asking him to do, which was to set me up with the right people in my life. And it took me um, quite some time, a lot of prayer, and probably keeping some good people at a, at a pretty safe distance before I, I was able to let go and really let the, surrender and let the Lord take over and, and guide me in the direction he wanted to. And no sooner did I, do th did I actually do that, that Jamie and I really uh, were able to move forward. He came back into my life, and it's been a wonderful blessing to see how God has worked when I have trusted him. So I encourage everyone here, whether you've been through something, you're going through something, or most certainly at some point, unfortunately, will go through something heartbreaking, 
surrender it to the Lord and ask him to surround you with the right people and accept what he is doing in your life and, and see the joy and the blessings that come and the healing that comes. service this morning. You know, music is one of the most powerful ways to communicate in the universe, and um, it is a privilege for me to be able to share um, with people that don't speak English and other languages, but music touches the heart of everyone. And I want to thank Pastor Dale for the opportunity to be here today. And I also want to thank you for your support of our program uh, at the Community Church last year in November. Um, and I want to close our service today with the closing song uh, from that concert. It was a program to 
celebrate 25 years of music ministry. Uh, and I am thankful because there are some people here uh, that have been involved in helping and promoting and supporting that work. Um, Bruce Jacobs, our ABC manager, um, has helped to let people know about this uh, work. And his wife, Marilee, uh, was part of the video company that put this uh, program together. Uh, so I'm very thankful uh, to them. And I want to apologize for something. Normally at the end of a service, I stay to be able to greet uh, and talk with people and pray and, and share. But as soon as we're done here, we are going to fly low to Huntsville, Alabama, because I'm doing a concert there this evening at the First Church in Huntsville, which is opening and celebrating their new uh, sanctuary. Um, and I have to get there in time to play for the closing of the service. So I am not going to be able to stay and greet uh, you and talk and so forth. And I just wanted you to know that it's not what I wanted to do, but it's how it has worked out. If you would like to support this uh, music ministry today, there, there are a couple of ways that you can do so. Um, one of them is that in the lobby of the church, at the end of the service, th there will be a table that has a number of our CDs, our DVDs, a book, an autobiography. And you can take those home with you on the honor system today. What is the honor system? First of all, if you're visiting a Seventh-day Adventist church for the first time, I want to welcome you because you are truly the flower that adorns the sanctuary today. Seventh-day Adventists keep the biblical Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And during these hours, the aim is to spend in communion with God and in fellowship with one another. So when you go to the table, you will not uh, buy or sell or anything like that. Everything that is there, you can take with you on the system. What is the honor system? There's a little form at the table that has two parts to it. The first part, you fill out and leave with us. And the second part, you take home with you, along with your CDs and DVDs and book. And that's got our address, our email, our phone number, so that after the Sabbath ends, you can take care of it. It's called the honor system because it's between you and the Lord, whether you follow through or not. Now, I read in the bulletin that the sun sets at 8.53 tonight, and my suggestion is that at 8.54, you follow through. <laughs> Amen? I don't think I need to say anything else. <laughs> and uh, Marilee Jacobs will be there uh, to talk with you. Uh, she knows us well, uh, and she knows uh, any information that you, you might uh, request of her. Uh, so that will, be, um, that will be there. Over the last um, 13 years, I've been involved in something that the Lord impressed me to do, which is support the Lord's work in Cuba. When I left Cuba in 1980, I remember people were being thrown in jail just for simply preaching the gospel, but over the last 15 years, things have opened up quite a bit. And many, many thousands of people have been baptized. In fact, since 2001, um, as I began to get involved with uh, an organization and a ministry to bring uh, the gospel to Cuba, more than 40,000 people have been baptized by the grace of God. And last year, the Lord impressed me to open and start a foundation, a nonprofit organization, to continue to do God's work in Cuba, bringing Bibles to the people of Cuba, sponsoring lay pastors, giving them equipment, printing Bible lessons, as well as supporting those in this country who want to use music as a way to reach others for Christ as a ministry. And so we want to start a scholarship fund to be able to support young musicians who want to use their talents for God's honor and glory. And I have this dream of one day opening a music academy where young people can come and study and learn how to serve God with their talents. Um, and so as I start to play this last song, you're going to receive a little envelope that says healing music. And if the Lord impresses you to get involved and support this mission and this work, then I invite you to fill out that envelope. And as you leave, the deacons will stand at the doors to receive this envelope. But I want to tell you uh, one story about Cuba. And one of the first projects that we were involved in supporting, which was to turn of these new Christians 
new people that were baptized, 2,000 of them, trained them so that they could be lay pastors. And they could then hold evangelistic meetings in their home churches because it's difficult to build new churches in Cuba or even remodel the old ones. And so we started purchasing TV and DVD or VCRs back then and putting them in their home churches so that they could show videos and lessons and instructions and so forth that we had put together for them. And one of the very first lay pastors to use one of these TV slash VCRs went around his neighborhood inviting people to come to his home church. And one night he went to a bar and he gave out flyers to all the men in that bar that were drinking. Outside the bar were four men playing dominoes. And he handed each one a flyer as well. And he noticed as he was about to walk away that there was a man in the shadows. It was dark, but he saw his silhouette there. And he went to hand that man, laying there by the side of the street, one of these flyers. And as he went to do so, the men that were playing dominoes just a few feet away said, Sir, don't bother with that man. Don't waste your flyer on him. But the man that was laying there, drunk, overheard, and he says, well, can I at least see the flyer? And so he went to hand him the flyer again. And one of the men playing dominoes said, listen, the reason why we tell you not to bother with that man is because that man is no ordinary drunk. He's the official town drunk. He lost everything because he can't stop drinking. Nobody can help him. Don't waste your flyer on him. But now that drunk man sat up and he said, listen, sir, if you give me whatever it is that you're advertising, I am going to go. So he gave him the flyer and left. On that night, the first night of the meetings of those five men at the bar, who do you think was the only one that came? The drunk man. The only one who was desperate enough. And he listened. Halfway through the program, he got up and left because he was drunk. But the second night, he came back. And the third night, by the fourth night, he was coming sober for the first time in years. And on the ninth and last night, when the last presentation ended and the lay pastor invited people to give their hearts to Jesus, the first person who stood up was that drunk man. And God changed his life. And he was baptized. And he is no longer drunk. He is now one of our lay pastors who reaches out to drunk people in Havana, in Cuba. So it doesn't really matter what we've done. The thing that really matters is what Jesus can do. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I invite you to give your heart to him today. That's really why we're here. Because I want everybody to, number one, have the opportunity to accept Jesus. And number two, know the joy that it is to serve the Lord. May God bless you. May God bless this church. And may we leave here with a growing desire to use whatever gifts, talents, abilities God has given us to share with others. Amazing grace.
Our gracious God, we thank you for the gift of music. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your compassion. We thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, allowing us to have our hearts touched today through, through music. I ask, Lord, that you would bless Jamie and his family, continue to be with them in their ministry, May they be, continue to be a blessing for you and for your kingdom. I ask, Lord, that you would bless each one of us. Bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lift up your countenance to us and give us your peace. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.